the way of Will John. Guys, what's up? We are back. We have C.W. Lemoyne, who is a super badass. I'm just going to go ahead and <laughs> throw that out there. But you know, that's what we like on it. That's what we love here at the podcast. So, C.W., what's going on? How are you? Hey, appreciate you having me on the channel. Big fan. Thanks for uh, taking the time yeah, to chat with me Of course. Me today. So, I, I to get straight into it, uh, as I mentioned, you do a lot. You have done a lot. And one of the cool things on the channel is that we like to take people from all walks of life, uh, you know, and glean some information for them, you know, and then all the crazy stuff and all the funny stuff that goes with it. So before we dig into that, why don't you tell us what all you've done? Because you've already just mentioned to it to me off air and I can't repeat all of that. So throw it, throw it at us. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I First of all, I'm just very fortunate. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. I've had a lot of good opportunities. A lot of people have come into my life and given me chances. And that's really what it takes is to be able to take advantage of those chances. Uh, I was told at a very young age I was never going to be a, a fighter pilot. You know, I didn't have the vision for it. And I ended up flying uh, Air Force Reserve F-16s. So I uh, flew that, did a combat tour uh, in Iraq in the F-16. Did that for about a thousand hours, then flew the F-18 in the Navy, uh, Navy Reserve as an adversary aggressor. And then I uh, went back to the, uh, actually was told once again, you know, you're, you're grounded because I had a kidney condition and they said, hey, you're done. Uh, fought back from that and ended up flying uh, T-38As where I'm currently at Air Force Reserve. Uh, in that time, got an airline job, uh, flying the 737 for a major uh, U.S. airline, and then uh, became a reserve deputy sheriff. And just like a couple weeks ago, I got my <laughs> helicopter pilot's license. So uh, try to stay. Oh, plus oh, I wrote man. some books too. So hey, check out No Justice. I'm going to pitch it. Uh, July 27th is the uh, release date. It's book 11 in the series. So I've written uh, 11 books, and like I said, just had a lot of great opportunities and been very fortunate. Uh, it, it's to amazing to see you guys that have served, which, uh, I mean, there's a level up and there's a level of clarity and mentality that you guys okay. need. And number one, I've got to say, and we've had, you know, guys, uh, as a matter of fact, we had army ranger on who's actually, who, who was, uh, oh, cool. injured in service and, uh, ended up playing now and captaining, if I'm correct, the Paralympic men's national team, you know, and it's, oh, cool. it's just that mentality wow. yeah. that, you know, I, I want to say winners, have but it's 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 also you guys that throw yourself from a life of regardless of where you've come from uh, you know into this life where you're gonna have hiccups and obstacles and all these things that's just kind of a given and you guys are like yep i'm gonna go through this i'm gonna i'm gonna go straight into it do what i gotta do and uh and it, it, it's just crazy to see but so i kind of want to know a lot of the guys that are listening to this they're all athletically inclined uh and your guys's training and stuff like this is probably you know second to none uh, in the world. Uh, anyone who, who who joins any sort of military service is probably going to go through some rigorous training. So could you just kind of describe yeah. some of the stuff that you went through? What, uh, was it tough or what did you yeah. learn? Anything you can glean? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's one hundred percent a challenge. And the first thing I'll say is you know the the ranger you're talking about, they're the real badasses, the door kickers, the guy that, you know, the guys on the ground, that's who we support. That is our whole mission. Everything is a support asset for the tip of the spear, the boots on the ground and stuff like that. So, you know, we're, we're not to be glorified or anything like that because it's a, it's a mission that we all do together. And those dudes are just awesome. So I think it's awesome that you, you talk to a guy like that doing that for our training. Um, you know, especially we'll talk about fighter pilot stuff. We, we start out, uh, you go through officer training school, they teach you how to be a leader, or at least they, they kind of, they don't teach you how, they give you that license to learn. They just teach you, okay, here are the basics, here's what you need to be successful. Then you go to officer, uh, sorry, undergraduate pilot training. Uh, that's a one-year program, and that's tough. I mean, it, it really is. It's 12-hour, 14-hour days. You're on what's called formal release, where you have to be there the whole time. You're studying, you're going to simulator sessions for physical stuff. You know, you're still having to maintain the physical standards, but you have to go beyond that because you have to be able to pull G's. You know, G forces are, you know, right now we're sitting, it's one times the force of gravity on your body. You know, essentially you weigh what you weigh. Well, in an F-16, you pull nine G's. So that's nine times the force, you know, so you're talking with a helmet and everything, you're talking a hundred pounds on your neck with your helmet and, you know, your actual, your noggin up there. So it, it you do have to be in, in physical shape, but just the sorties are demanding because it takes so much mental work and so much mental effort to focus and then go pull G's and then remember what you've, you've been trained to do. So it becomes a lot of muscle memory and repetition and stuff. 
I, I try to mentor a lot of younger uh, pilots and people that want to do this. And one of the things um, beyond the make them tell you no, which we can talk about later, um, but beyond that, you have to be able to go to a, a simulator and because they give you free time to do it and memorize every position of every switch. And that's that's what I did. That's how I did well. You know, when I had free time, I was in the sim and just learning positions, because when you're in the jet, things are happening fast. You're moving quickly. You know, you've got the pressure of the guy behind you. And a lot of people get sick the first time they go, not because they, you know, roller coasters or anything, you know, gave them trouble and stuff. It's because it's the first time you're wearing all this gear. Nobody really thinks about that, but you're wearing a helmet, you're wearing a mask, you've got a harness on, you're strapped in, you know, you're cinched down, you've got a G suit on, all that stuff makes people have, it kind of, it just gets kind of a little claustrophobic, it gives you anxiety and stuff. So what I tell people is if you can kind of tear away some of the other stuff, then this stuff's not a big deal because all you're focused on is that one thing, that mission. And then it's, you're doing one thing to the next, you're doing you know, okay, I need the starting engine checklist. Okay, well, I know where that switch is. I know where this switch is. And, you know, you can do it blindfold cockpit sweep. And you take that. And then one of the most difficult thing we do is emergency procedures training. And the way the Air Force does it is it's, they put you, uh, it, it's called formal release. And in the morning at 6 a.m., you sit with your classmates around this table. And they'll say, okay, uh, Lieutenant Lemoyne, you're in the airspace, you get a firelight, you have the aircraft and you're supposed to walk up, put your books down on the table, stand at attention, and then you say four things. So you maintain aircraft control, uh, take the appropriate action, land as soon as conditions permit. And, and, and that is kind of how you get through, get through that. So you have to say, okay, to maintain aircraft control here, I'm gonna do this. I, I will you know, take my left hand, move the throttle to this place. Do I have a firelight? Here's the, emer the bold face supplies and stuff. And it's all the memory out of it. And they put you on the spot to make it to make it that high pressure situation so that when you're in the jet it's just rote memory it's just muscle memory i've done this before totally that's it you know that's it's, it's exactly oh sorry yeah so, go ahead. no me. no no go ahead go ahead yeah I, I was just gonna say that it reminds me of well, we just did a video on this and a lot of the things that you see across and i don't know if you've run into this you know and guys by the way he has an awesome youtube channel so make sure to check that out uh but anxiety is a huge thing in society now yeah. probably more so than it was 20 years ago, I mean, actually, not probably, 100% more so than... Oh, for sure, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, one of the things we spoke about when guys are dealing with anxiety, just on the field, you know, let alone a, a life or death situation, is the preparation. Is that preparation, repetition, will allow you to then pull on your instincts when you're in that situation. It's not hard for you to pick up and drink a glass of water. You don't have any anxiety over this. You've done it so, so much that you could do a million other things and still pick up the glass. And so, uh, you know, we kind of stress that and what it sounds like also what they've done to you guys is almost like visu visualization. Uh, oh I yeah, mean, for sure. How big is that? The concentration, all that, how big is the mental side stressed when you're actually learning to do something oh, yeah. this intense? Well, and, and going back to what I was saying earlier, I screwed that up, by the way. It's maintain aircraft control, analyze the situation, take proper action, land as soon as conditions permit. So if anybody's watching, they're going to go, he got that wrong, sit down, because that <laughs> we already is edited literally, it out. <laughs> yeah, that is literally what you have to do is you have to say those. And if you say them wrong, they make you sit down. And if you sit down, you don't fly. So they put that pressure uh, on you to know that, Hey, this is real life. You know, this is, you have to get, if you can't get it right at zero knots and one G you're not going to get it right. You know, pulling three or four G's at 200 knots, you know, in the T six, for example. So they kind of, they make it to where you go through the hard stuff or the difficult stuff early on to, to build you up for, you know, when you're in the aircraft and stuff, you know, recently I had a compressor stall. So I had an engine failure and while you're flying, you done it. Yeah, when I was flying a T-38 and, you know, um, actually even better than that, when I was um, a, a student, when I was a student pilot in the T-38, I was, uh, we were in a, for, a formation. So it was two aircraft. We were doing a formation takeoff. I was solo. It was one of the only formation solo rides. My instructor's in the other jet with my actually next door neighbor, uh, another student. And when we rotated to take off, uh, a bird split the formation, went right down my right intake and, you know, the the RSU guy, the guy on the ground goes, Hey, it sounds, looks like a big blowout or flame came out your back and it failed the engine. I mean, it just disintegrated the, the motor. And so 
on a hot day like that, the T38 really struggles. It doesn't doesn't fly real well on one engine. And you know, I made it up 10 feet by the end of the runway, took off, did the emergency procedure and stuff. But one of those things, I had trained so much and memorized so much that I instinctively, you know, because it, it was you, you go throttles max. So you, you take both air throttles and put them in afterburner, uh, check the nose to get it down, get your airspeed, get up, get, uh, get your airspeed and climb away because you have to make a decision. Am I going to stop or am I going to keep going? I, they talk, talk about temporal distortion because I did not know there was so much time in my mind when it happened that I actually thought that I went to idle, tried to abort and then decided to go. But when I watched the video, it was immediate afterburner take off. But my mind had slowed down so much that I went through every single possibility. I'm like, okay, I'm at 140, 165 knots. I should probably, nope, I'm going to keep going. Like, but it just happened milliseconds. So it was one of those things that the amount of training they had given me and the ability that they, you know, it was, it just happened. Like you didn't even think about it. It just, okay, engine's out, I'm going. And after that, once things slowed down, then the rest of the training takes over where it's like, okay, maintain aircraft control. Okay, well, we're climbing away. We're away from the ground. Let's analyze the situation. Okay, here are my indications here on the right. Um, you know, this engine's not looking so great. Uh, take the proper action. Let's get in the checklist. Back me up. You know, now we're coordinating with each other and talking through and stuff like that. And then land as soon as conditions permit. We're not going to keep it flying. We've already had a problem. And that level of, of training, you know, just to handle, and this is just basic pilot training. When you talk about an F-16 or an F-18, that's the, we call it motherhood, the admin. All that stuff is we barely talk about it because they expect you, you're good. Now we're talking tactics. Now we're talking, okay, you see the enemy do this. What are we going to do? And you're trying to do that at nine G's. You know, you're supersonic. You're going, you know, Mach 1.2, trying to make decisions, you know, because that's 12 miles a minute. You're doing 12 miles a minute. He's doing 12 miles a minute. It, the range is just collapsing. You have to start making decisions. But What's the way like? we get through it. Sorry, yeah. It, I mean... it, it, it's... It's not people, unless you're low to the ground, there's no sensation of speed. It's just a number. It really is. I mean, really? in fact, that's why we call it the number because you, you watch the airspeed indicator do a little dance uh, or the altimeter actually does a, a little thing because the pedostatic system, because you got the shockwave. But after that, it's routine. I mean, it is, we are, we've advanced so far as a society that breaking the sound barrier is just like, eh, okay. You know, I did that today. Like, it's just, unless you're, unless you're low, if you're low altitude, you know, 500 feet or less. Yeah. Cause you see trees zipping by and, and stuff like that, but at a high altitude, it's just, okay, I need to be at this airspeed because, you know, we're trying to, we used to say, get high, get fast, do good work. You know, we'd get, you know, go up real high, get, get a lot of speed. And then now you're making decisions, but because you're doing that, you're moving so fast, you know, like I said, 12 miles a minute. They're moving probably fairly similar. Range is collapsing. You have to make those decisions. But again, we go to the simulator. We talk through it in the brief. We know we do the study. You have to do the study on the ground because you can't wait until you're moving 12 miles a minute to make that decision. You have to have already known. You have to already go, he's doing this. I'm doing this. That's the end of it. It's just like, you know, running plays. You can't, you know, in, in sports, everyone has a playbook. They don't just wing it. You know, it's not a pickup game. Because what it turns into, we call it the roving motorcycle gang. When you're trying to defend a target and everybody just starts doing whatever they want and then nobody does the right thing, you know, because it really is a lot like soccer. Uh, we do what's called defensive counter air. And it's literally, we've got a point and we have to defend that point. So we put our guys out front, we try to defend that point, And then worst case, we bring a guy back, we call it the goalie cap. And he just hangs out back there to try to make sure that striker doesn't, you know, bomb gotcha. your target. So it's, that, it's, there's a lot of carry over there. It's tons. It's tons. Yeah, I always find it fascinating. And just speaking of that, not too long ago, we had a, a, a chess grandmaster uh, on, and it was really cool just to get his whole idea and trying to uh, all of these principles and the protocol of, of how to take and do. I mean, obviously, there's a whole lot of um, uh, similarities to, you know, uh, fighting with with planes and doing all this and sports you know which is a simulation of war in a, in a in a certain sense um and yeah it's all i find it just insane but when you mentioned uh how different it is to fly obviously low altitude or high altitude what's the highest you've flown like what what is high do you go uh, uh, crazy 50, 
50,000. 50, Where 40, am I 50, flying 000. then when I am just on a normal flight across Europe? Most airliners, uh, unless you're going across the pond, uh, are in the 30s. So sometimes you go up to 40. Really don't like to go up to 40 when I'm in like a 737 just because, you know, it doesn't perform as well. But um, if you've flown, like, I don't know if you've flown like Gulf Streams and stuff like that, those guys live in the light, low 40s. They'll be like 43,000 or so, like a 78 or a 777 will be in the low 40s. But typically, most airliners you'll see in the 30,000. So we're only 10,000 10, ish above that. You can't see anything, but we're not talking stratosphere, anything that's way, 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 way no, up there. It's not no, even different no, at all. The, yeah. That's, that's U2 guys and SR-71s and we're not wearing pressure suits and all that stuff. You know, sure. it's just because, and that's partly why is because you get above 50,000 feet. Now you start, you know, now you start getting worried about Armstrong's line as you go even higher. Um, you know, if you, the cabin depressurizes, even though you're wearing oxygen, you know, now you, you, there's physiological effects that can happen if you go very far above 50,000 feet. So we just, you know, in the forties and thirties is probably as high as you'd want to get. Well, then speaking of these, you know, in the U2, how, how high up does the U2 go? I don't know. Roughly 80,000, something like that. 80,000. 80, That's 000. crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. you must have, and this is, I did not think of this, which is amazing that I didn't, but you must have seen all of the, UFO, all of the talk. Have you talked about? <laughs> have you talked about uh, any of this on the channel yet? Have you commented? Are you staying video, away from it? I, 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 I am staying away from it. I did a video um, about uh, the DOD, so Department of Defense, released three videos, and it was from the the infrared, the forward looking infrared, the the targeting pod, the AT FLIR, and I just broke them down. That's all I did. I'm, I'm like, look, I'm gonna take what's official. And break it down. I'm not going to make any judgments or anything like that. I'm just going to say, hey, here's what it could be. And the fallout from those videos, just the comments, you know, because I think it, when you get into that topic, it's almost a religion and people want to, they, you know, it's the I want to believe. But then if you say anything that's counter the, to what they already believe, they just, they, you know, they, they'll try to convince you. And it's like, look, I don't know. I just don't know what I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've personally never seen anything. The, the unidentified things that I've seen ended up being identified. Like it was like, oh, I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah. OK, it's it's a weather balloon or oh, it's it's something else. I don't have any personal experience with that. I know guys have, you know, and I'm not saying that what they're what they're doing. My thought on the whole thing is it's a big universe. The odds of, you know, something else being out there. Yeah. Okay. Pretty good. The odds of us being visited? Probably not. I mean, I, I just, with us not knowing it, unless, unless there's something we're just missing, I don't know, but I, I, I try to avoid it because it's, it's one of those topics where it's just like, you know, I, I don't know enough, you know, I, I'm not smart on it. Right. Yeah. People feel very strongly on the UFO thing. I mean, it's a oh, fascinating yeah. subject. There's no, yeah. there's no way around it. I mean, there's probably nothing yeah. more fascinating if we find out that, you know, sort of definitive oh, be, proof. Right? It would be cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I love I love the alien stories like, you know, Prometheus. I thought that was a really good concept. Uh, even the new Chris Pratt movie, The Tomorrow War, you know, I mean, oh, I haven't you seen look it. at yeah. the alien stuff like that. It, it's got its issues, but it's still yeah. entertaining, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. but stuff like that. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fascinating. You know, I, I, I'd, I'd love for it to be true. Well, obviously not the planet killing aliens, but the idea of, you know, there's some something else out there for sure but i'm just not going to be one that goes yes they exist no they don't exist i don't know well then uh even still somewhat on the same subject but not necessarily why does it have to be aliens right like how, what about all of these everybody has i mean it's not this is not secret knowledge that from the the, the major superpowers in the world I, are working with propulsion systems and trying to do things and trying to advance all sorts of things that's just fact we don't have to discuss that or not so have you seen is anything like does anything pop out in your head are you thinking like wow that would be cool this is possible or you know i mean obviously you're not going to be able to comment if you've flown some crazy thing but i find that so fascinating because it doesn't necessarily make its way all, all the way to the commercial i would love to get home from europe to kansas in in an hour if we could just get that out yeah. of the black world you know right. i'm just saying right i understand yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm you with know. you and, and it's entirely possible. And, you know, I will say that people are like, well, it can't be something classified because the Navy didn't know about it. And I'm here to tell you, 
the Navy within itself probably wouldn't know if the Navy were testing something. Like the, 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 the level of bureaucracy that is in our military and government, it does not, it would not surprise me if it were some, you know, black site, skunk work. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and they were testing something and they just happened to stumble upon it because somebody didn't do the right paperwork at this point to make sure nobody was around or something like that. You know, I mean, because it, it's the government. I mean, anytime the government's involved, they're probably going to screw something up. So, yeah, I, I firmly believe that that is possible. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's it's cool. To, it's cool to talk about, but I wouldn't you know, it's again, it's not like we're, um, you know, actually making contact or anything. You know, everything is unsubstantiated until you get something high fidelity until it is. Oh, and then, yeah. And, and you mentioned there's, there's issues with Chris Pratt's movie, which I'm not even sure what it is, but one of the cool things to see, uh, is, uh, your breakdowns on things. And these have been, have been yeah. pretty popular. Uh, so could you throw us, and I'm pretty sure we broke down with the army ranger, uh, and I, he's going to kill me that I don't remember his, uh, I'm not remembering his name, Josh Jordan. I'm I can't terrible remember right now. I'm, I'm terrible I'll, with yeah. names, man. Don't worry. I'll, I'll edit it perfectly. We'll have it edited perfectly. So <laughs> <laughs> it flows perfectly right now. Yeah. But what then, and I saw, I think you was 25 things that airlines don't want you to know. Oh, Airline pilots yeah. don't want you to know. And that was brutal yeah. for you. I saw you shake your head uh, at that. Yeah. And then, so yeah. then two things I, I'd love to know. What out of those 25 was probably the most annoying uh, or the most ridiculous? And... Right, let's start there. Let's start there. I won't. I won't I, forget. I gotta my remember other. what the what the twenty five things were. I can. I can I, tell you some. Uh, there was the one that yeah. made you put your hand in or put your head in your hands was to deal with yeah. something that I thought was kind of true, or that I just never accepted. You know, there are these things that you hear about planes and stuff like that that you don't really mm -hmm. because I have no knowledge. I can't fly a plane. I don't right, know anything. Right, I get on the right. plane. I get off. No critical thinking goes into it. Uh, yeah. It was that the ice was part of the water supply um oh, in God, the plane no, yeah and the thing w with that is you just wouldn't want it to that water is not <sighs> i mean no you which water are we talking about we're talking about the water for the toilet and the water that comes out of the sink the, yeah the lab water i mean it, it's not it's not it's not unsafe but it's you know it's from a truck and it's not meant for drinking like it's not the kind of water you you would you would drink. Like we get ice packs, like they're catered. All the ice is catered and stuff like that. Um, that's yeah. And then like the coffee water and stuff, that's all boiled. You know, that's that's all sanitized and stuff like that. It it's you wouldn't want an ice maker on on a plane because then how do you? It would be expensive. You know, how would you clean it out? Keep it sanitized? You'd have to have filtration systems and all that stuff. They don't have any of that. That would add weight and all kind of stuff. And it all comes down to cost. Um, I think, I think some of it, that article, if I remember right, like one of the things they were saying was, um, like the pilots, you're surprised that the pilots aren't actively flying the plane the whole time. And you're like, why would you want the pilots flying the plane the whole time? Like, geez, dude, you know, like autopilot, man, FMS, you, you know, you're a systems monitor when you're an airline pilot, you know, you're, you're really getting paid for, you know, when things are not going well. And I think that's what people don't understand, especially when we start talking about automation and AI and all the stuff. It's not that the plane can't fly itself. It's that the plane can't fly itself when it has a malfunction and it doesn't know it has a malfunction. You know, you look at the Air France incident where the, the pitot system or the uh, flight control system, you know, it iced over, it had some issues and stuff like that. And even then with two people that were fighting each other and neither could figure it out because they were low time not trained, the captain was in the back, all that stuff. You, you, that's where we get paid the big bucks, you know, as they say. And, and, and that's, that's where it becomes, hey, you want that guy that's got 10,000 hours, that's flown military or he's flown commercial his entire career and stuff like that, because that's where the thinking comes. That's where the, oh, I've got to override this. I've got to fix this because, you know, we've never seen it. You, we, we've heard uh, the, uh, what is it, Sioux City? The, the accident with the DC-10 where the, the hydraulics failed and stuff, and they had to basically fly the aircraft. They had to get an engineer from the back, and they were like, okay, how are we going to land this thing? And they ended up crash landing, but they landed enough of it to, serve, to save a whole bunch of people. And it was because they were thinking outside of the box. It wasn't just, okay, we're screwed, because the checklist didn't have an answer. It's like, well, we've never seen this before. And that's, I think that's what you need is that human ingenuity 
uh, of we're going to figure this out because a program, you know, AI is just going to go, okay, yeah, sorry. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does not compute, you know, zeros and ones. It's, you know, we're, right. we're out. It's it. Good luck. Totally. But, well, one of the things that was also on the list was uh, that planes get struck by lightning all the time. That's true. Yeah. That, that seems crazy to me. That that happens. Um, I've been struck twice uh, in fighters. Uh, one of them, actually, I, I talked about on the channel um, because... So one of them is an F-16, no big deal. You know, electrical system just kind of did a little fritzy thing. And then there was a little, you can see a little spot where it blew out of the... Uh, do you feel water. something though? It's like, you, is the plane in, shake? In, well, no, mm -mm, no. no. Okay. Um, in the F-18, there's no lightning protection for the pilot. So what happened with ours is we were in a two ship. So it was a section, two aircraft. We were together, uh, lightning uh, hit his aircraft and then arc to mine. I felt a little static shock on my mask, my face, you know, because it's just where it made the connection. He was actually keying up the radio, and it just so happened that it was going through the comm antenna and going out. Um, it literally, like, it, he got tased, essentially. It was like he, he thought that it was like every system in his body turned off and then turned back on. He was uh, disoriented, kind of a little bit out of it and stuff. And we had to do, I mean, basically the Top Gun, you know, the opening scene for Top Gun, I had to come back and talk him down. Um, I seriously thought that was one of the few times in my career where I thought I was going to watch an airplane crash because he was just, he had to go do hyperbaric chamber to get back and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of the one end of the spectrum. Uh, typically because of the safety systems and the, in an airliner, you know, for talking airlines, this is fighters, but you talk airliners, the safety systems, the static wicks, uh, that, that can discharge the electrical en energy. Um, and kind of circuit breakers and limits and stuff like that, y you'll see a, a like a, a burnt mark on the aircraft and it'll probably need an inspection, but that's about as far as it's going to go. It's not going to take the aircraft out. Um, we don't, you know, and that was one of the things people didn't understand about that video is because I said, it's no big deal, but we also don't go fly into it if we don't have to, because thunderstorms have a whole lot of other problems to them, like hail. Um, you know, you've got uh, turbulence, it'll be really bumpy, uh, weather and that by itself, you know, we have to slow down because you can overspeed the aircraft because, you know, the airspeed will ramp back up and then all of a sudden it'll ramp back down. Um, so there's a lot of dangers with a thunderstorm that we avoid, but that's not to say, you know, if we get struck by lightning, that's the end. It just, you know, it, it's, it's two different things. So, okay. Yeah. Well, you, you, you brought up top gun, which takes me, which was yeah. exactly my next thing. <laughs> How either annoying or nice is it to see in Hollywood movies? How far off are we in what we get? Like, well, let's just go with Top Gun, which I don't think the new version is out yet. Or did no, it come out? It, that it's not been out. Delay no, it's delayed, been delayed, right? So much, man. Yeah. Okay. All uh, right. I, I, I am excited. Well, let's talk about Top Gun because Top Gun was a great movie. Uh, Top Gun Maverick, I think, is going to be a great movie. Like, I'm excited. For that, and in fact, that whole Mover Ruins movies thing started because I did a reaction video to the Top Gun Maverick trailer, and I just pointed stuff out. I'm like, "This wouldn't happen," or whatever, and people were like, "You ruined the movie! Yeah, yeah you yeah, ruined yeah. that so, movie! Yeah. That's it!" And I was like, <laughs> yeah. "Huh? Well, that's a funny name for a show." Okay, it's tongue in cheek because I don't actually mean to ruin it. Of course, but I do like to to point out because it's 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 for entertainment. Like what I do is for entertainment just as much as what they're doing. So. The fact that I say, hey, that's that would never happen. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean it's not entertaining. It just means Hollywood has no idea and they obviously didn't have a, a director. So um, some movies get it a lot better. Uh, you know, like I, I was watching, I did a thing with Planes, the little Disney movie. And I was oh, like, God. dude, they got the com right. Like, this is awesome. The cartoon got it right. Yeah. And then some movies are so stupid that you're like, did you not like pay somebody? Asked. Like, yeah, yeah. Like just just call somebody and go, hey, is the stick on the right or the left? Like that's that's all. And they're like, no, it's on the right. Well, why'd you put it on the left? Oh, because the the scene's going this way. So I'm like, well, then flip the scene. But you know, I, I wish there were more movies that were aviation centric. I mean, I I appreciate the 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 challenge that it presents. I know it's expensive to do, and 
I wish, you know, the Air Force has a history of not wanting to cooperate with filmmakers. And so we don't get a lot of good Navy or Air Force movies. We get a lot of good Navy movies. You know, the Navy's like, yeah, we love it. We're recruiting, you know, let's do as many movies as we can. And then you get Final Countdown, Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick, all that stuff. And we get Iron Eagle. So you're like. <laughs> yeah, which terrible. I don't even know, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's crazy. I, I don't remember the last big Air Force. That was a cool thing for me just growing up. I, I can't remember yeah. when the original Top Gun came out, but I know it 86. was yeah, 86. 86. So, so yeah. I'm 85. So, but it was around yeah. like when I was still, yeah. like I remember, you know, reference to oh, it yeah. being on TV and stuff like that, but I probably didn't see it properly until I was a bit older. But a lot right. of the things that happen in every Air Force movie or video games too, because I know you've, you've definitely talked about video games as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, you know, there's nothing more fun. There's so it's tons of fun, and those are probably yeah. even further off from the realism than the movies, I would imagine. But yeah. what is it then? So let me just get this, uh, especially for people that are probably out there. Dog fights don't really happen a whole lot. Is that correct, no. or did they happen no. a whole lot? Or have you no. and, been? And I, have you experienced I, well, that? Or I think a lot of Hollywood um, knowledge comes from World War Two. Like, I think a lot of the, like the general public and stuff, like the way they, they see dog fights and stuff is in World War II, where you're close in, you got to get real close, like 50 feet because you're out, you only have a 50 cal and it's, it's, it's different with modern missiles and modern jets. You know, the problem with that is if you actually showed a real dog fight with a F-16, for example, and an F-15 or F-22, you're talking a mile away. So for the longest time, cameras couldn't do that because, you know, you didn't have the high definition so you could zoom in and, and all that stuff. So that's why Top Gun had to be as close as it was. Like, I get it. I understand why it's doing that. To answer your question, though, as far as the dogfight and stuff, people ask me, I get this comment and they're like, well, how do you know? How many kills do you have? And it's like, again, you got your knowledge from World War II. It was common to be an ace in World War II. The last air-to-air -air kill, I think, was 2013 or 2014 um, in general. Like, we just worldwide, you know, there's probably a handful in the last 30 years, and most of them being Desert Storm, you know, and, and, and those kills were not dogfights. Those were, you know, missile shots, you know. I mean, the last guns kill, I mean, God, I don't even know. You'd have to go back to Vietnam. It's just, it's, it's not common. Our wars are not... You know, because you have to have some kind of near peer adversary or you have to have somebody that actually can fight you to get into a close in dogfight. Most of the time it's going to be beyond visual range or some kind of missile shot or it's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I talked about my deployment. We didn't I mean, we were doing air to ground. I mean, the last 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq is all close air support. It's all that's all we're doing. I mean, once. Once Saddam's Air Force was down, there's no more air war. I mean, and most of those kills happen on the ground. Uh, I interviewed a guy in, from Desert Storm who had an air-to-air -air kill with a A-10, and it was a helicopter. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was you know, you're talking, when you talk air-to-air -air kills, you would think, oh, it's a guy that, you know, mixed it up with, with a MiG or something. It's like, no, it's a helicopter. And that's just, uh, I think you're right. It's That's a big misconception in general. That's because that's basically what I think. To, I mean, that's the go to. But yeah. obviously I have it's yeah. coming from Hollywood. It's coming from that or it's coming right. from even TV or video games because that's it. And I get it. That's the most sexy thing that we can do, uh, you right. know, is yeah. it, it keeps oh, yeah. you engaged yeah. and, you know, yeah, it, it, yeah, it is knife, what it is. It's, it's 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 the you know knife fight in the phone booth is what they you know, they call it. Cause, right. You know, that's that's your that's your fight. I mean, it doesn't. It, it doesn't have a whole lot of action to it if you're like, okay, he hits the he hits the pickle button, the missile goes off, the guy dies, he goes out. Like, there's no, like, what 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 is the what is the thrill of that? You know, uh, you could make it thrilling, but then it would be classified. So then somebody would go uh -huh. to jail. I see. <laughs> okay. Well, then, is there? Uh, I've always wondered this. Is there a person who's been considered like the greatest pilot ever? Like, is there a star? Or are there, are there stars for each country, you know? Uh, I mean, for the U.S., Robin Olds, uh, I think, is universally, you know, well-respected just because he was a badass. You know, he flew. Uh, he was the guy in Vietnam that, that came up with all the, the tactics. You know, hey, we're going to 
put the thud in this area and then we're actually going to make it look like it's a thud, but it's actually F4s and we're going to go get the MiGs that have been killing our guys. Uh, he was an ace. He, you know, he had swagger. He had, you know, he looked cool. He had that mustache. You know, he's just one of those dudes didn't, wasn't afraid to tell the brass, you know, hey, you guys are all screwed up. And we're just one of those dudes like the, the ultimate fighter pilot. Um, I think as generations have gone on, especially in the, in the U.S., as we've gotten away from the swagger of the fighter pilot in general and gone more to a corporate mentality where, you know, we, we've gotten away from some of that culture because, you know, the Air Force is like, look, we, we can't do this anymore. We can't have uh, wild parties. We, you know, we can't do O-Club stuff. You know, we, we have to be more responsible. So the Air Force has basically said that culture can't stand. So it's kind of gotten rid of that identity to where, you know, everybody's on a level playing field. You, you, it doesn't allow that person, which causes frustration in the guys that are, hey, I'm just tactics. I just want to, you know, kill everybody and, and, you know, win the war and everything. Those guys get out. They just leave because, you know, they can't handle the new culture. And then the guys that take charge are the ones that, you know, did the master's degree and did the, you know, they're smarter. They wrote the papers and, and did all the stuff required for promotion. So... I think we've kind of drummed that out to, to the point that unless we got into another shooting war, like we went to war with you know China, Russia, like a big threat country, I don't think you're really going to see it because it's more of a quiet professional, you know, you do your job and you go home and you go on to your airline job or whatever's next. Wow. Yeah. Because, I mean, people always in World War Three and all of these ideas were never going to be sick, I guess, technically of... Uh, of speaking about them and what it would be like. But since it's been so long now, I mean, I guess it's not so long, but it's been quite some time since we've had superpowers really uh, in an all out war. And I, I've read some interesting books uh, and I, I believe it's called new war. Uh, but in the sense that we may never have that full out, you know, uh, type of war again, at least not in the same way, given that, we keep getting distant. Our, our, our weapons can go further. We don't need to deploy ground, you know, <laughs> troops necessarily, you know, and so it, it, it makes one wonder, but that doesn't make that clearly still for, for, I mean, the, the air force is obviously always going to be <laughs> useful, especially even more so now with drones and all that stuff. How does that, what's, what's, what's up with that? Like how would someone who can fly a drone or is flying drones, they're not, trained to fly a plane are we going to never have pilots like are you an, ex an endangered species right here in the I in 60 I years i don't think so no? no i i don't i don't think so just for now um, uh -huh. you know none of the fighters that are coming out are are unmanned um you know even the sixth gen that just they just you know started talking about it's got a cockpit it's, it's manned i think what you'll see is more of a hybrid concept where you'll have you know one main fighter in a package and then a swarm of drones that can go do drone stuff. Um, you know, so it's going to be a little bit of both where you're kind of the quarterback and you're telling the little drones, you know, what to do and, and all that stuff. Uh, I don't see them just going because my argument against drones has always been two things. One, look at how much stuff gets hacked right now. I mean, how vulnerable anything with any kind of electronic footprint is, um, and without a, a human in the cockpit, you know, that's, that's a problem. The other part to that, and people say, well, that cockpit can get hacked too, but actually no, it can't. If there's no data link, if there's nothing connecting it, you know, you turn that off, there's no way in versus a drone, which either there's two problems. It either has to have a constant data link, which you have to make sure that's a secure data link, which again, we can't right now. I mean, look at all the stuff that's being hacked. But on the other side of that, if you say, hey, well, AI is going to do it now, now you're talking about an ethical issue because you've taken the human out of the kill chain. And so are you going to go send a drone autonomously to go? We don't even do that right now. Like you don't send a human to go kill without humans, other humans in the decision tree. You can't like if you know, you, you, you have to have that decision matrix and you have to have that human in the loop. I, it gets a, it, there's a lot of moral and ethical issues when you start sending drones autonomously to go kill. Cause what if something changes, you know, what if you change your mind? Well, now does the drone know that it's you or being hacked? Like there's, I, I, that, that, I think that will, I'm not going to say always, cause you never say always, but 
I think that is a compelling argument to keep a human in the loop at all times. You know, you can, you can integrate them, but I wouldn't go, Hey, we're, it's the end of the fighter pilot era. Cause I think that's just tough. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously a concern. I mean, I, I, I guess it makes, it's kind of like this, uh, scared of technology type thought, but it does, I see it not just, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, fighting and, and, uh, you know, but I see it everywhere else. I mean, we, we are kind of in a sense wanting to continually just delegate everything to the computer just do it i don't want to do it anymore we've done this as a humans for thousands of years now we've earned it we're done you guys do the heavy lifting and then it's it's, it's almost to a point you know one has to wonder are we going to get to the point where we've delegated so much that we're useless and i know it's a kind of a hilarious sci-fi thing right where the machines turn on us but it's also kind of it, what do we become it's we i, I think and, and i see this from a lot of the great thinkers let's have a little bit of critical thinking. Let's regulate. And I'm not really super one for extreme regulation, but like slow down first. Like we don't even know, do we know where we're going with this or why we just want to, we want to automate everything. We want machines involved in everything. We want AI to handle everything because it's faster and it's smarter technically, but we do have a lot of good qualities that I think we should probably, you know, <laughs> we're still <laughs> using mix. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the idea. Well, and you look at, you talk about sci-fi, but if you actually look at, you know, some of the like super futuristic sci-fi, like space sci-fi and stuff, they actually use the AI to make their lives easier, not to replace themselves. You know, you still have a pilot of the Enterprise, you know, you still have a pilot of that ship in the Expanse, you know, that the Amazon show, you know, that they, they still put the pilot in the loop. It's just the AI does all the stuff that takes real big calculations so that the pilot, all he has to do, everything flies the same. It's always, you know, left hand throttle, right hand stick, and the computer's just figuring out how to make that work. And I think that's realistic. I just, you're right. Just be careful what you wish for, because at some point, and going back to a tactical or strategic argument, if you rely too much on automation and the automation's taken away, then what? You know, it, it, is, it is not, you know, solar flares, EMPs, all the stuff that currently can can affect technology, you know, I mean, I think we're already at that point. You know, if we had a large scale EMP attack and people lost the Internet for any amount of time, I mean, they'd be rioting and burning down. I mean, we're just I, I, we can't live without it. So I, I think you're absolutely correct that, you know, it's one of those things you got to be careful about. Yeah. And I've 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 seen, you know, there's a slight pushback on that idea because every culture and every society when they come up with new technology there will be a little pushback and then we'll accept it you know it's very rare that we push back against the technology so much that it just stops developing um so we are in for some changes for sure and they're happening very quickly um but you 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 touched on space also and i'm curious space force is a thing i don't know enough yeah. about it what Nobody what could does. happen out there? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I mean, like, I, I don't think anybody actually knows what the Space Force is. So, yeah, I, I, okay. I guess. But, like, if you could speculate in a certain sense, I have two things that I would be cool to hear just your thoughts on what it would be. Are we going to have wars in space, literal wars? And is that feasible to any? I, I mean, just move it from why in the air? I mean, why not just go higher up? We have things, satellites are up there. And I mean, there is, in a sense, stuff up there that's valuable. You yeah, know, I mean, that was the premise of the actual show Space Force with uh, uh, oh, what's the, his name from the office. The, yeah, the, the office, sitcom. Steve Carroll. Yeah, sitcom. right. Steve Carroll. Yeah, he, they, they were fighting on the moon. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, anytime you have, you know, anytime you start branching out, I mean, it's obviously conceivable that you're going to start fighting there. I mean, that's that's, you know, we had ships in, in the, the olden days and that's how we fought it. We had airplanes. We fought. I'm sure at some point, I think right now, though, the Space Force, the biggest thing the Space Force is going to be useful for is protecting our satellite systems. Because without our satellites, like we just talked about, you take those satellites out, your navigation's gone, your a lot of the internet is gone, uh, a lot of our communications, our global reach is gone. So I think they have a, and, and I think the Air Force was already doing this, so they just basically made it its own thing so they could fund it. But protecting the, those assets is a huge priority and it may not be you know space lasers and stuff like that but it may be 
you know, China launches a satellite that can ram another satellite and we have to intercept it, or China, you know, uses cyber hacking and we have to, you know, use denial methods to try not to get our stuff hacked so they can shut it down. I think that's more realistic short term. As we go long term, we colonize Mars or we colonize, you know, the moon or whatever we're doing. Yeah, you're going to have to protect it somehow. I mean, anytime humans are involved, we're going to fight. Right. Um, I just, for the record, you brought up space lasers. So that way, this is my question now. <laughs> space Start lasers. Freaking laser but, bees. Yeah, yeah, but not even. Well, how, how, what about all these things? I definitely saw something, and I don't remember where. We, we have another podcast with a couple other guys that, that, that play football, and we talk about just the crazy things that we see in the news and stuff. But did you ever run across any alternate weapons, lasers and things? Are we putting those on our planes? I've seen, I, I mean, I've seen it in like the media, you know, they, the aviationist or one of those places will do an article about, um, uh, you know, companies that are developing and stuff. There's, there's been talks, like, I think one of them was a laser that is used on aircraft, like commercial aircraft or large aircraft that can't maneuver. And the laser can take out missiles. So, you know, you got a missile inbound, the laser goes, got it. And it just takes the seeker head out to the point that, you know, it can't, it can't track you anymore. Um, you know, that technology will change just like every, just like the missile changed how, you know, World War II, you start talking lasers. Now you're changing the whole battlescape for air to air. And it's just one of those things that really smart guys, weapons officers and stuff like that will just have to adapt and add to their you know, list of toys. Well, yeah, I mean, it just seems natural that uh, things are going to gravitate towards more of this type of things. But I mean, as you said, though, if, I mean, if dog fights aren't really happening in that sense, uh, then we're looking at, you know, planes being able to attack well, certain. It could, it could come full circle. I mean, you, you could, could get to the point just like everything else, you know, you, you, you start out and you go, um, you know, we're, we're going to be beyond visual range and then both sides have the ability to take out the missiles. And then now you're suddenly, you know, you're, you're dog fighting again. You know I mean? It, it, it there's, there's no way to predict what's going to happen with technology because we come up with something, they'll come up with something to counter it. And then we'll come up with something to counter the counter and it'll just be this vicious cycle until eventually we're dog fighting. We're just dog fighting because, you know, that's it. And then who knows, who know? who knows what they're going to come up with. The nice thing is they're very smart people working on the problem and that's the best part, you know? Right. And, um, I, I would say it's, it's, pretty cool to see all of the changes. I joke in our other podcast a whole lot, like I said earlier, how I would like to go from Europe to Kansas City in an hour. And I feel like, and I, I joke, but I'm also at the same time, I really don't feel like we push enough. I, I, I get that. Sorry, I shouldn't say that we haven't pushed enough. I would like for the commercial side of planes, which have been around for some time now, to deliver a better product and not the same product that it was delivered in 1970. And I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. It's worse than the product it was delivered in 1970. Okay. I mean, it's, I mean yeah. in 1970, people would fly in their suits. It was a very, <laughs> you know, I mean, nice, yeah. you had the, the, big, the big meals and stuff. And uh, I, I, even Coach got a meal. Uh, okay. Hell, I remember the 90s, yeah. even Coach got a meal. But the problem, I think, with anything, you know, you, I think you're touching on a good point. Regardless if it's aviation or what, as we've grown to a more profit centric and litigious society, um, I think it, it slows down the innovation because you can't, some of the stuff that we thought were, was cool, you know, in the fifties and sixties, as far as technology and stuff, well, now a lawyer, there's so much red tape that, you know, insurance costs and all that stuff. And we've, we've tried to go, okay, you know, what affects the bottom line versus what affects innovation? You know, as long as an airline has no incentive to make it a better product because they're filling seats, you know, as long as a spirit airlines can give you a seat that doesn't recline, they'll do it. And if they can charge $40 and, and, you know, do it on volume versus doing it on, you know, a hundred, $200 for somebody that, you know, is going to pay. I, I just don't know how you break that business model because, Again, federal government has created so much red tape and so many regulations that no one wants to step out of their comfort zone where they're making dollars and dollars and dollars. And if they fail, the government's going to bail them out. So you, you get into this situation where it's like, we just want status quo. We're not going to innovate because 
And I, you talk about the, the airline airliner going fast. You know, I think it was United that said, hey, we're going to have the supersonic airliners again. I honestly would be very surprised if they actually come through with that because there's just the, the, the cost margin. That's why the Concorde ended up failing is because the Concorde, you know, it did that, but the liability was real high and you only could travel. I think it was like 40 something people. You know, there's no profit margin in that. There's no, I mean, there's, there's, there's no, they're not making, they make money when 176 souls are in the back and they paid something and they come back. And so that's why, like I flew the 737 and that plane drove me nuts. Boeing just drove me nuts because the cockpit, if you look at it, it's got all nice glass cockpits, but then the overheads are the exact same they've been since they were, you know, 1960s, whatever it came out, because it's just like Boeing 707. There's no room in the cockpit. There's big circuit breakers and stuff. And you're like, dude, this thing's got the new car smell. Why does it look like it's from 1965? And it's like, well, because it became, it was money because Boeing said, well, it works. We don't want to change type ratings. We don't, the FAA said, you're going to have to get new training if you do that. Southwest said, well, we don't want to do that. We're not going to pay for that. You know, it all boils down to the money. And I think as a society, as we've allowed ourselves to get more and more government and more and more red tape, that we've gotten to the point where it's like everybody's too scared because, well, I'm going to get sued. You know, yeah. I'm, I, I can't lose that cash cow. And so yeah. I think you're right. We've plateaued hardcore. Uh, it you know? seems like it. It, se it just yeah. seems like it. But it's not something we, we question. Or and, and, yeah. and this is something that every society kind of runs into you know, at the end of the day, it's the people. I mean, we, we, we always talk about the government. The government is made up of people who are also citizens right. and grew up as citizens of the, of the, right. the country. And, and it, it is the people that will always have the power, whether or not they exercise that properly or not. And so yeah. if we do want to change, it would take, you know, people to just stop. I mean, it, it, it is still, it's funny because it is yeah. still about the bottom line. If people stop traveling, someone's going to figure out a way to get them back in the plane to do whatever. Obviously, we're talking about a black well, swan event, but yeah, go that's ahead. That's what's happened now. People stop traveling. I mean, so COVID-19, <laughs> people stop. Sorry, I don't want to get your channel demonetized. The Verona no. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. can't mention. But but <laughs> I, I mean, know. to get yeah. people traveling, you know, we've done $39 seats. And now watch the news. People are fighting. You know why they're fighting on airliners? Because they paid $30 for a ticket. You know, I mean, it, it it's... I, I don't want to call it a class war. You know, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be, have affordable travel. But what I'm saying is when you when you're given something or when you are, feel like you're entitled to something, you don't appreciate it as much as if you, you know, paid three hundred dollars for that ticket. So you get people that feel like I have a right versus I'm very fortunate to be on this plane. Um, and I'm, I'm you know, I, I feel like I, I should be here versus I deserve to be here. Um, the, a, a recent example of that I did a video on was a guy who was flying from Miami to Charlotte. And what happened, they started to take off the door open, the cockpit door, cockpit door open, made a loud noise. They were like, okay, we're going to abort. We're, we're taxi, taxi around. And the pilot said, Hey, we just had a door open. We're going to go and take off dude in 1960 or 70, the passengers would have been like, all right, let's light a stogie. You know, I'm glad we're still alive. But this dude, called yeah. the Miami Herald. He called customer service. Oh, he, no. you know, he wanted, he demanded to know why the, why they aborted. And it was so scary for him. And it's like, uh -huh. we have created this world where we can't innovate because you're always answering to people like this, you know, and, and you're right. We are the people, we are the ones that have to do it. But I just wonder how you take that away. You know how, how you take that sense of entitlement away. That's a it's a very good point. I don't I don't know. You know, uh, and that's an issue I see. I see it. I see it even, and and it's funny because you're technically a YouTuber too. I don't consider myself a YouTuber, and you clearly don't either. But you do see it in stuff like comments. Like as a guy who you know, we provide a lot of uh, tools for guys to get better, healthier, faster, stronger, and and to how to navigate the pro world. That what that did not exist. When I was growing right. up, it was, yeah. I had a VCR from some tapes that my dad <laughs> got me. If I want to figure out a move, I just have to keep rewinding it back and forth. And that's literally yeah. what I did. And so it's hilarious when I see people going like, oh, why'd you choose this, <laughs> this move? This sucks. Like, give me something. But where is your, where did you get that sense yeah. that I'm, yeah. well, you're not paying for either, which is the problem, yeah. like you said. With a, with a pro athlete giving you basically one-on-one -on -one instruction. 
it does That's it. crazy. How? Yeah. How? You know, and and obviously that's there. There's a good portion of people who are very grateful, and we get tons of good messages, which I'm sure you do too. But on the flip side, it's like, dude, there was a, a world where this you couldn't message pro athletes or anyone at the tip of your finger. You have the world's knowledge in your hand. It's crazy, you know. And so, yeah, I, I, I it is kind of a, a pet peeve of mine to see stuff like that. But before I forget, I want to touch on one question. Since we, were, we were already off it. Is there something crazy cool that like we could say to a flight attendant or a pilot if you're on just a commercial airline that would like make us in the cool crew? Or like, what do they talk about? Like, what could we say? Is there anything going on that would be? I would say please and thank you. Uh, and <laughs> be you'd nice. probably be, yeah, be nice. I mean, I, honestly, no, there is nothing you can say. But if you're just nice... In a world where I, I have the utmost respect for you know the cabin crew in the back because they deal with just I mean especially right now and people are frustrated they're tired they don't want the mask mandate anymore they're just you know and also they're entitled so that you're you're adding all this stuff on top of, it, of itself I I think that in this world I'm I'm not even kidding. Just be nice. Just please, thank you. You know, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Th just little stuff like that, where you show them some appreciation and respect, which we are lacking in our world today, goes a long way. Because honestly, there's nothing you're going to say that's going to impress them. Um, there's nothing you're going to say that's going to you know make you an insider or anything, because they don't care. I mean, not that they don't care because they don't like their job. It's just it doesn't do anything for them. It's just like if you're sitting in an exit row, well, pay attention to the brief, acknowledge, take your earphones out, just little stuff that shows that you're a kind, caring, compassionate human being. I mean, that's all. Just just be the person that you, you want people to treat you. You know, I mean, that that's it. That's and, and it, people don't do it. They still don't do it. They still, you know, are rude. And, you know, if she's trying to ask you, what do you want to drink or any, I don't know, are they doing cabin service anymore? I think they're starting to go back to it. But you know, just, just little stuff like that, I think goes a long way. And, um, I'm sorry, that's not the cool answer you were looking for. No, but. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> that's a real answer. It's the real answer yeah. because I think that's what, that's the success of your channel and the, the, the success of our channel and our channels that we have comes from authenticity. It comes from the fact, yeah. and, and we get annoyed at the other, and I'm sure this is a question I, I, I pose to Josh. I'm almost a hundred percent sure <laughs> Army Rangers name is Josh, <laughs> if I haven't edited this out already, but there is a there is a thing. Uh, is it called fallen valor, stolen valor? Stolen valor, yeah. Stolen is it stolen valor? Thing. Is that a thing yeah. in the Air Force? Do people do that? Uh... Yeah, a lot of the times it's done in like the video game communities. You know, the flight sim communities and the the <laughs> How video so, game though? nerds. Which, which they, they feel... that's funny. You know, you were just talking about getting hate mail because or whatever. I sometimes huh. do these uh, the the DCS the video game stuff. Which okay. by the way. If I call it a video game, it triggers them first off, which I love calling <laughs> it a video game just for that. But I got a hate hate letter one time that was like, yeah. you're not taking this seriously. You should have read the manual and learned the thing before. Because I go fly like a MiG-21. I've never flown a MiG-21, but I'm like, well, let me try it and see what happens. I'm a fighter pilot. I can fly anything. And of course, I'll crash. I'll be a fireball and I'll be like, that was awesome. Like I'm having fun. And people get like so triggered that I dare have fun in their game. And the uh, but those sometimes in that community, there have been instances where guys will like there was one actual YouTube channel where the guy was claiming to be a, you know, an instructor in a certain type of aircraft. And he was charging Patreons to do flight lessons and stuff on DCS. And I was like, you just I mean, like, OK, I, I get it. But but why? Why? You know, what is this? What is this? What does this get you? You're a virtual fighter pilot that's now claiming you're a real fighter pilot so that other virtual fighter pilots will respect you. That's that's enough. But that's enough. That's enough in this in this new world where you have likes and you have Instagram and that translates into real things. And I mean, there's two things that I, I would say from that. One of the guys that I played against, he played for AC Milan, which is a massive Italian club. He's a he's a Dutch guy. And he was just I, I caught an interview where he was annoyed at people who wanted to be stars rather than be good at the game. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. uh, and he said, you know, if you just flip that, if you just try and get really, really good, he's like, it kind of took care of itself. He said, I never wanted to be a star. He's a massive international 
you know, superstar anywhere he goes, you know? And uh, he said, it, it, it basically takes care of itself. So you'd be better off trying to, think. but that faking the thing, we, it, it happens in our community too. There are guys that are faking being pro athletes in order to, and then teaching kids. I just have an issue with it personally, where I see kids wasting their time following this advice. And then, you know, uh, what happens when you do those trainings and you don't get anywhere? Well, of course you didn't get anywhere. Well, look what, but he's selling himself as I'm this Pele, next Pele. It's just, you know, (laughs) so I don't, it annoys me. And, you know, I don't, I don't call him out. I haven't yet, but uh, it's just, we'd rather focus on giving good quality, doing the stuff. We'll, cream rise to the top, which it does. If you just keep going, you know, they fall off or they get uninterested because it's all fake anyway to them. They don't really care. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm not surprised that that's (laughs) the idea behind it. Yeah. And I mean, it's flattering to a certain degree, you know, you're like, okay, well, you know, I appreciate you thinking it's cool enough for you to fake it. But on the flip side, it's like, just, just be you you know what, be you, be proud of who you are, of what you've done. And people will follow you based off of that. Don't, don't try to create stuff that, that doesn't exist because people will see through it. Eventually people always see through it. They will. They will. Um, okay. Well, listen, we've gotten through basically almost every, everything. We'll have to get you back on here to go through a whole lot more sometime, but the books, you, all the stuff, where do you want? I mean, guys are going to go check this is obvious. They're going to go straight to the YouTube channel. I know that, but there's going to be plenty of links in the, in the description. And if you're listening to this only, obviously the links are in the show notes, but where would you send people if they want to see more? Easiest is uh, my website, cwlemoyne.com. That's probably the, the fastest and easiest to remember. I'll send you a link to the uh, pre-order link for the new book, No Justice. But um, yeah, cwlemoyne.com, the YouTube channel and any social media, it's all cwlemoyne. So. You're all there. Okay, perfect. Listen, Awesome to have you. Uh, we'll definitely have to do it again. Thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, I, pre- yeah. I appreciate it. We'll, dude, we'll get you on my channel. We'll, we'll not we'll love smaller to. audience, but we'll get you on, on the channel. You can uh... <laughs> love to. <laughs> Anytime I can learn, I'm just, I'm addicted to learning and doing all this stuff. And these yeah. sort of conversations I is probably the biggest and best reason for all the stuff that I've, I've done. I don't know how I would have this opportunity. And so I always take it. I've always, and I've said this on the podcast, I guys that are listening, I, I, don't, I really don't care about you. Not in a bad way but I'm here to learn. (laughs) He's here for me to learn. And that's it. If you learn something also, I'm happy for you, you know, and I think that's the goal. But uh, anyway, yeah, thanks guys. We will see you later. Check all the stuff out. Peace.